Good morning. How are you guys today? Awesome, awesome. Happy Thanksgiving week. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. My name is TJ. I'm the director of Growth and Outreach here, and it is a pleasure to worship with you guys this morning. Welcome. If you are a first-time guest with us, we want to say a special welcome to you guys, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, as you guys walked in, you saw these on your seats. This is our Connect card. I hope I can get it out there. This is our Connect card, and this is our offering envelope. Uh, we can worry about this later. But the Connect card is so important. It's our way of connecting with you. So if you are a first-time guest, go ahead and fill out as much information as you feel comfortable sharing with us. And then at the end of service, hang on to this and take it out to our first-time guest table. We have a special gift for you. It's just our way of saying thank you for being with us today. If you're a member or regular attender, go ahead and update any information that may have changed. Uh, if you've not filled one of these out since we've been back, uh, meeting here at Challenger, please go ahead and do that just so we can keep our system up to date and make sure that you don't miss out on anything that we have to communicate to you. Uh, down at the bottom is a place for some next steps that Kimberly will talk about later on at the end of her message. And then on the back side is a place for prayer requests. Um, our prayer team is amazing. Um, they are such an awesome, dedicated group of people that takes every single one of these prayer requests. They enter them into the computer, they send them out to our staff, and they personally pray over each and every one of these prayer requests. So please, if there's something going on in your life that you need some prayer for, or if there's a prayer that God has answered and you need somebody to celebrate it with, Take advantage of this on the Connect card, and then you can uh, place these in the uh, offering buckets, or baskets, I'm sorry, um, boxes, whatever they're called. I don't know what they're called. Uh, they're all around the auditorium, though. Put them in there at the end of service. That's where you'll also put the, uh, the offering at the end. We are trying our best to be safe and contactless, so we're not doing the uh, offering baskets handed out at the end of service. You just put them in the boxes there, and uh, hopefully I didn't mess that up too bad. Hey, a couple of things we want to celebrate. Yesterday, who uh, who's participated in Fort Hernando Day yesterday? Anybody in here? You could tell the people that did Fort Hernando Day yesterday because they're a little bit sore. They're probably limping around from all the yard work and everything we did yesterday. But guys, what a blessing and what a win for the kingdom of God here in Hernando County. We were at six different locations, actually more than that because we had a team of water bottle handout people that went all over the county just giving out some cold waters. But we did yard work and mulching and landscaping and all kinds of stuff at uh, five different schools in Hernando County. And that will bless countless administrators, teachers, students, and families uh, that go to those schools. And it was just an awesome way to, to practically show the love of Christ uh, to these schools. And the, one of the best things we did yesterday was so awesome. Out at Fox Chapel Middle School, we partnered up with another church in our community, which is the whole goal of Fort Hernando, is that there'd be no division amongst churches in our county, that all the churches that preach the Bible and believe Christ as their Savior would be one, and it wouldn't be a competition. And so for these churches to partner up yesterday and work together uh, side by side, didn't matter what com congregation you were from, these guys worked together out of Fox Chapel yesterday and did a ton of work to make that school look a little bit better than it did before they started. So awesome win for the kingdom of God. On your way in also, you probably noticed in the lobby, man, I told you all last week we were a generous church, and you guys have proved it once again. Second service hadn't even been here yet, and we've already filled up all the boxes and all the things we've got for the food drive. If, yeah, let's clap for that. I love my church, guys. I love it. And um, if you did not get to bring food today and you'd still like to do that, there is time. They're not coming to pick it up. People helping people will come pick it up this afternoon between 12 and 1. So if you want to run out after this service, don't leave now. Run out after this service, go to Publix down the road and bring some back. You are more than welcome to do that as well. I know that was a lot, but we're going to continue worshiping. Um, before they do that, let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity again, as I say every week, Lord. I don't want to take for granted. We don't want to take for granted after what the last seven or eight months has held for us, Lord, the fact that we get to meet here together. So thank you for opening doors, Lord. And uh, Father, we pray that you would open our hearts as well to hear from you this morning, to hear what uh, you've given Kimberly. We pray that you'd give her boldness and confidence and courage to preach your word without shame, without fear, Lord, so that we can be uh, just grown in you, Lord, so that we become more like you, so that our relationships and our marriages look more like you, so that the world around us, Lord, so that the darkness around us would be pushed back as we bring the light everywhere we go. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, all right. How's everybody doing today? Come on, let's pray. God, we thank you for today. And God, we pray for, for the people that are standing in an Egypt. That God, today, your presence 
fills them. That they know that where they're at, they're not alone and that they are headed to somewhere that is better. Because we know that you are a God that does not leave us alone. You do not abandon us. You do not leave us to figure out. But as your followers, you come and you take us by the hand and you lead us to what is better. When we just stop and decide to follow. So God, I pray for the hearts in this room today that they are open to follow that they are open to hearing what your plan is and that they are ready to be guided into what's next. God, I pray for the relationships in this room that through today's message, they will find healing, they will find hope, and they will find a renewed spirit and fervor for chasing you. We love you, Father, and we thank you for being a dad who is in our every day. In your holy name we pray, God. Amen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. My name is Kimberly, and for those who don't know me here, I'm the children's director, and I love hanging out back there with your kiddos, and every now and then they let me come up here and talk to adults. It's kind of amazing. But if I start talking in like weird little kid talk, that's why. It's because usually I'm back there spending time with your awesome kiddos. Um, if you haven't checked your kids into CBK, you got just a couple minutes, you can check them in because here's the thing. We have an amazing fun things planned up here today, but we've got even more fun for them back there. We want to give them Jesus on their level in the best hour of the week. And I can't come up here and not tell you how great it is. Thank you. So make sure that you jump back there and get them checked in so that they can have their own fun. But today, if you guys have been following along, we have been in our series, Marriage Matters. Has anyone been here for the last few weeks of Marriage Matters? Awesome. Uh, Listen, I need that. Let me just tell you a little bit about Kimberly. She needs feedback. Otherwise, I'm like going to cry on the floor. It's a whole thing. So just, just go with it. If you feel it, say it. So we're in our series, Marriage Matters. And over the last few weeks, we've talked about what that looks like in our relationships. We've talked about love languages, how God's created our marriage. And last week, TJ talked a little bit about seducing your spouse. Just a side note, TJ talks about that all the time, not just when he's given a mic. So today we're going to talk about, today we're going to talk about marriage. But I think it's important to note that while God cares about our marriages, God cares about all of our relationships. And I understand that there's people in this room who aren't married or who were married or who never want to get married, but all of you in some way are in a relationship, whether it's a relationship with your kids or your parents, whether it's a relationship in dealing with that ex or relationship in dealing with your friends. And what I know is when we chase after Jesus, our vertical relationship will lay the groundwork for what all of those horizontal relationships look like. So my encouragement to you today is no matter how many times the word marriage comes out of my mouth, I want you to fill in that blank with wherever you are. Because I promise you that when we focus on Jesus in our relationships, he will change things and he will move mountains and they will become more than you could have ever asked or imagined. You guys ready to talk about some Jesus stuff today? It's going to be good. So they let me talk about marriage because I've been doing it for a little while. So my husband and I um, have been married for 18 years. He's the one who keeps track of the dates, guys. And just, it's a weird thing. So we've been married for 18 years. We got married very young. We have six amazing children. And most days we actually have a really happy, awesome marriage. Um, so I have a few things to say because today we're talking about choosing your spouse in different seasons of marriage. Now, I realize I say 18 years, and there's a few of you out here who may have been married for five or six, and they're like, whoa, she's old, and she looks amazing. (laughs) And then there's a few of you out here who have been married for, whatever, 25 years or 30 years, and you're like, what can she even say to me? And so my encouragement today is, then don't listen to Kimberly. What's God saying to you today through this message? Because what I understand is it doesn't matter who stands up here. It doesn't matter who holds the mic. When our hearts and minds are open to hear what Jesus has to say, we'll hear it. So wherever you're at, I just want you to hear it. How many of you who are married can remember your wedding day? Was it a big deal, a big to-do? So for me, ours was super simple. And we actually went to the Justice of Peace. But I, I love watching wedding shows. 
okay? So where you have like the bridezillas and everybody gets all hopped up and, and there's like the giant dress and all the flowers. Did anyone in here do the giant dress and all the flowers? Come on, give me a woohoo. No. <laughs> so they're like, why do we spend all that money? Uh, <laughs> So our wedding day often looks like this huge celebration of a commitment, which is what it is. But what if we took the excitement and the fervor that we put into planning our wedding day? I mean, we go to cake tastings to make sure, I mean, it's just an excuse to eat more cake, but we go to cake tastings to make sure it's exactly the right one to suit the day. We design special drinks. We come up with specific hashtags. That's the thing now, right? We make sure all of our bridesmaids are just so. Our guests have their own dress code. Chairs are lined up perfectly. We find the perfect venue a year, two years in advance. We put all this time, effort, and energy in. But what if we were to use that not as the max of the best day of our marriage as we start off, but what if we use that as the launching point? What if that became the standard of the effort that we put into our marriages? So you're not married? You're single? Maybe some of you have kids. So what about the time and effort and energy you put into the baby shower and designing the nursery and finding just the right pediatrician? Making sure everything is just so and the the car seat locks in tight? What if we took that energy and we put it into how we parent our kids every single day? Or maybe you're single and haven't been married yet. Have you been on a first date? How do you look when you go on a first date? Seriously. Nails done, hair's done. I get it. You guys think I look like this every day? You're crazy. <laughs> but you make yourself just so. You take time picking out the, effort, the outfit. You take time getting to know the person, maybe over text or a dating app. You put in effort. But what if that effort didn't stop at the first date? What if that effort was just the standard of how you care, not only for yourself, but for that relationship? Or maybe you're widowed. You still go to lunch with your friends, right? Or maybe when they come over for coffee, you make sure your house is just so. It's the same idea. The time and effort and energy we pour into relationships shouldn't just be in those moments that we think are the the Kodak moments, the moments that matter. There's a trend right now on Instagram. Maybe some of you have seen it. It's a Um, I think it's called How It's Started, How It's Going. And so with this trend, you post a picture of kind of like you and your significant other and like where you started at. And then you post a picture of where you're at now. I think I actually have mine. We could throw up for just a second, not long though, because it's terrible. So this is our How It Started, How It's Going snapshot. Most people, what I have found when you you can take that down, it's seriously not amazing. Uh, (laughs) Most people I found when they post that picture, one of the things we notice about the picture is not just that the quality isn't amazing from the old picture to the new, but like, how about a glow up, right? I thought I looked amazing when I was 20 years old and engaged, and then I look at the now picture and I'm like, look at me. (laughs) But when I see my friends, it's the same thing. It's like, man, they look a little younger, but time has been kind to them because we've learned We've learned more about ourselves. We've learned maybe not only how to make ourselves look in a picture, how to stand, how to do our hair, how to do our makeup, how to wear an outfit, but we've learned who we are. So oftentimes that picture goes from one thing to the next, and the glow up is a result of confidence. The glow up is a result of understanding what we want and where we're headed. So it's a perspective shift, because what if we flip the script and decided that where we are is simply the launching point to get to what's next, but not only what's next, but what is better. You know, in Scripture, in John, um, we hear about a miracle that Jesus did. Nobody was surprised when I said this was the one I chose to talk about today. But it's at a wedding, and it's the miracle of Jesus turning water into wine. Hey, hey. And when we step into this scripture, we can see a lot of things that work out for us for every single day. So let's just jump right in. In John chapter 2, verse 1, we read, On the third day, there was a wedding. It took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. So it's important to note here that Jesus was there before the trouble ever started. 
He was at the wedding day, and he was celebrating. And we know, because the story is kind of familiar to most of us, that something is coming. But you see, while I'm sure Jesus knew that, he was already there and in place when the celebration was still happening before the trouble ever hit. Verse 3, we read, When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. So what do we do when the wine runs out? Somebody at this wedding was responsible for the wine. Somebody was. So for this illustration, let's just say the wine in our marriage, or whatever relationship you're in, is love, faithfulness, kindness, honor. So who is responsible for keeping the wine flowing? Now, it's easy when those things run out in our marriage to say, well, it just didn't work out. We just fell out of love. But you see, an issue without anyone at fault is like an earthquake without a fault line. Somewhere someone stopped. Somewhere someone gave up. Somewhere someone decided it wasn't important enough to make sure that the wine in their marriage was flowing. So in this case at the wedding, we could have blamed it on the the wedding master, maybe the party planner. It's not his fault. It's not his fault. Just like in your marriage, it's not the church's responsibility to keep the love flowing in your marriage. Well, but Jesus knew. Jesus knew that wine was going to run out and he could have stopped it. It's not his responsibility to keep the wine flowing in your marriage either. He can equip you, and he can help you, and he can guide you, but at the end of the day, it is your choice to choose your spouse every single day. What about the disciples? They were there. They could have kept track of things. They're supposed to be responsible for things, right? What about them? They weren't responsible for the wine in the wedding either. Just like when you go to counseling, it's not your counselor's responsibility to fix your problems. Well, what about the servants? It's literally the servant's job to serve the wine. But it's not their responsibility to make sure there is wine. Just like in your marriage, your kids are not responsible for maintaining the love in your marital relationship. Kids, If you're here and your parents are having issues, it is not your fault that they can't work it out. Our kids are not responsible, even if they make us angry, drive us crazy, keep us too busy to focus on anything but them. That's not their responsibility. So if none of those people are responsible, then who is responsible for the wine at the wedding? The people with the most at stake. The couple that's getting married is responsible for the wine. Just like you and your spouse are responsible for maintaining the flow of love, of honor, of faithfulness and fidelity, of kindness and compassion in your marriage. So it's the first thing we have to do is is we have to take responsibility for what we are called to be responsible for. We pick up in John chapter 2, verse 3, and we read, When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. And he says, Dear woman, why are you telling me about this? Jesus replied. The time for me to show who I really am isn't here yet. His mother said to the servants, Do what he tells you. In my head, Now, I know it's wrong, historically speaking and theologically speaking, but in my head, Mary's like definitely like the Italian mom who's like, just just handle it. Just do it. Just go. You got this, boys? You listen. You listen to him. But you see, when we read this, we understand that Mary didn't ask or tell Jesus what to do. So what did she expect? What did she think was going to happen? So maybe, I mean, at the end of the day, it is her kid, so maybe she thought he was going to just run to the store and get more wine, or maybe they had wine at home, and so they thought that, or she thought that he would just run and grab wine. Either way, 
Mary knew that he would handle it. Maybe she didn't expect him to do a miracle. This, for those of you who don't know, was actually Jesus' first public miracle. He had never performed one before, so maybe she didn't realize that that was his plan, that he would perform the miracle. But you see, she didn't tell him what to do. She didn't even ask him how he was going to do it. She simply said to everyone else, do what he says, because she knew he would handle it. How often in our marriages do we have issues, do we have problems, and we don't even call out to God because we don't know what to ask. We don't even know what the fix is. We don't even know if we want a fix. You know, I told you we've been married for a long time, and there have been seasons in my marriage, and we've hit seasons where the calls out to God were groans. I've hit seasons recently with friendships, not even in my marriage, but with friendships where the calls out to God were groans. But you see, he hears those. And I don't have to tell him how to fix it. I don't have to tell him what I need to get through it or even what I want it to look like on the other side because you see, sometimes in relationships with people, people are really messy. I don't know if you guys have noticed. But sometimes we don't even know what we want it to look like at the end. But if we stop and we trust, we understand that even if we don't know what we want it to look like, Jesus knows what is best for us and what the best ending to that story is. So right away, Jesus responded and he said, well, not yet. The time isn't yet, but like, why not yet? The wine's gone. What better time to make more wine, right? Is it even a party if you run out of wine? I'm pretty sure it's not. But Jesus said, it's not my time yet. You see, sometimes when we talk to God, we don't get a yes or a no. We get a slow down, hang on, or I need you to go through this. So maybe that just moment of hesitation, that moment that Jesus took, is because people weren't ready yet. People hadn't felt the need yet. So the wine master knew but Jesus knew we need to take just another beat here. And sometimes in our relationships, we have to stop and we have to decide, have I put in the work? Am I ready for Jesus to actually come in here? One of the things we've talked about here at Crosspoint over and over is that when we prepare, they will come. Like if you build it, they will come, right? Down in children's ministry, Pastor Paul will say to us, if 50 more kids showed up on Sunday, what would you do? Would you be ready? So in your marriage, if God swooped in and said, ta-da, it's better, and now you're with this person forever, just like you signed up for, are you ready for that? Are you ready to accept it? Are you ready to put in the time and effort and energy? Because sometimes we need to stop and do a little bit of work because over, marriage is one, or over time, one thing I've learned is marriages change. And I'm not a huge lover of change. I don't hate it. But we all like things just kind of the way we like them, right? So it's important to take that change and make, make sure that as we're navigating it, we've taken responsibility for our own inventory during that time. So how are we preparing for the change in our marriages? How are we making sure that we have shifted through the changes and the transitions in our marriage in order to allow us to be ready for the next season? Because maybe when we pray to God, he's saying, hang on, you've got some stuff you need to do. And when we ask God, he'll let us know usually what stuff we need to do. But we can be prepared. So one of the ways that we can prepare for change in our marriage is to put change into perspective. Marriage is the joining of two imperfect people who are coming together to grow over time, over a lifetime. So when you're having a rough week, it's a little easier to handle a rough week when you understand that I have a lifetime of opportunity for happiness with this person. Put the hard things into perspective. Learn to understand, accept, and grow through seasons because that's all they are. Next, you can plan ahead for predictable change. 
There's things that are going to happen in your life and over the course of your marriage once you realize that it's, it's a long relationship or over the course of your friendship or over the course of your parenting. These are long relationships, and there's going to be seasons through them. So we can prepare for some of those. I know that if I'm going to have a baby, then I probably should change my expectations of how my husband is going to handle things around the house or how I'm going to handle things around the house or who's going to juggle what. Those are kind of obvious expectations. A few years ago, I, had, I was a stay-at-home mom for, not my choice, I just had a lot of kids, for 10 years. And God bless all the stay-at-home moms. And now I'm like, God bless all the working moms. Man, all the moms, right? But I stayed at home for 10 years. And then when I shifted into working, I started working in ministry. I started here at Crosspoint. And that change, which was an awesome change, was really hard. And I shifted into part-time. And then I shifted from part-time to full-time. And we kind of lost sync. Because you see, for 10 years... We had had our things that we handled a certain way. We had a certain way of communicating, of running our household, of parenting our children. And then after 10 years of the same, we stepped into a new season. And while it was a season full of blessing, it was a season full of trial. We had to learn how to speak to each other differently than we had for 10 years, which didn't make any sense to me because I'm like, things were great. And now it's different. But here's what I've learned through those seasons is it's better. Because when it got hard, we chose each other and we chose to work through. Every single day that it's hard, you have to still choose your spouse. You have to still choose a lifetime over a feeling. The other way you can prepare is to adjust to human changes. I am not the girl that my husband married at 22 years old. I'm just not. I've grown. And like I mentioned earlier, there's there's a different confidence. And with that comes a bigger mouth, if you can believe that. He loves it. I am not the same person that I was 20 years ago, but he accepts that and encourages that. And here's the thing. There are certain changes in people, we're going to just hit this for a second, that that are unacceptable. When people change and they decide to start making choices that are hurtful or harmful, when there's an issue of alcoholism, drug abuse, emotional or physical abuse, those are in a different category. So please hear me right that when I'm talking about people changing, there are boundaries around that change. And when your boundary starts hurting the other person, it's not okay. But boundaries and changes in people like a big mouth or a change in schedule or just a change in how I carry myself. Like Pastor Paul talked about a couple weeks ago and he said over time sometimes like our love languages change. Those are changes that we can acknowledge, just human changes that, hey, this person that I married essentially is a child I'm going to grow up with and then grow old with. And that's the goal. So if that's the goal, then we need to accept the changes for what they are. So we need to be prepared for perpetual change and continually adjust. Because the change isn't going to stop. And if we get stuck back here, that's where we run into problems. We also need to love unconditionally. And again, I'm not talking about those things in the other category, okay? Love unconditionally because marriage is an unconditional contract between two very imperfect people. And when we put it in that perspective and decide we're going to choose our spouse every single day, then we have taken inventory of our own responsibility in our marriage. And so when we cry out to Jesus, he's going to open our eyes towards something new, not towards the thing that we've been digging our heels in and saying, I'm not doing it. I say that because it's what I do. Also in that verse, Jesus says, it's not that time. And on that note, when he says it's not that time, sometimes he delays because we're not ready for it yet. Every now and then, I think there's moments where, where God says not yet because while the feast master knows we have no wine and, and while 
the servants know we have no wine. The couple hasn't felt it yet. The couple who, remember, was responsible. The people at the party haven't felt it yet. So sometimes when we're waiting for that miracle, is it a miracle if we don't even notice it happened? So I believe that God doesn't want to delay helping us, but every now and then he'll really ask, do you really want me to do this? Because then that means we have to put in the work, and then we have to acknowledge, which I don't know about you, but sometimes it's a little hard for me, we have to acknowledge that we didn't do it ourselves. So sometimes that's the miracle, is just getting over yourself. So we move on to verse 6, and we read, Six stone water jars stood nearby. The Jews used water from that kind of jar for special washings. They did that to make themselves pure and clean. Each jar could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the top. I'm going to tell you the obvious thing here. He took these stone pots that if we used them for anything else, they were no longer pure, which means he was going to use them anyways. We know stone pots are not the thing that wine's made in. Wine is made in wineskin, which is very flexible and it holds the flavor. Can we just take the obvious analogy? He used a stone pot. If Jesus can do a miracle in a stone pot, what can he do in your hard-headed, stubborn self? But here's the thing. The pots were available. We have to be available. The pots were cooperative. They weren't cracked. They weren't broken. They were there and ready and waiting for the miracle. In that verse, he says, fill the water parts. He doesn't say, fill the water pots. He invited human interaction. He didn't say, presto, chainzo, here's your wine, and fill the jugs. No. He had to get the people around him to interact with him. So they filled the pots. And he didn't want them partially full. He wanted it 100%. And you see, just like in marriage or relationships or friendships, it's not about two people giving 50-50. It's about two people giving 100% every single day. And in that, God doesn't ask for extras. He only asks for what we're prepared to give. When he changed water into wine, he didn't ask for yeast or grapes. He didn't ask for things that were out of their out of their reach, because you see, if they had had those things, then they probably would have already tried to come up with a concoction. Just like in our marriage, Jesus doesn't ask for more than we can give. He asks for us to give our time, our love, our compassion, our kindness. And when we do those, we make situations ripe for a miracle. When we prepare ourselves, we're preparing our relationships. In verse 8, We go on to read, Then he told them, Now dip some out. Take it to the person in charge of the dinner. And they did what he said. The person in charge tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He didn't realize where it had come from. But the servants who had brought the water, they knew. Then the person in charge called the groom to one side, and he said to them, Everyone brings out the best wine first. They bring out the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you, you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana and in Galilee was the first of his signs, and and Jesus showed his glory by doing the sign, and his disciples believed in him. So when Jesus changed water into wine, where was the miracle? Was it in the pot? Did the water change into wine in the pot, or was it in the ladle? Maybe it was in the ladle. Maybe the miracle was in the feast master as he sipped it. We don't know where that water exactly changed into wine. What we do know is sometimes the miracle is not before we ask or act, or after we act, but sometimes the miracle falls as we act. In John 3, we read, as their feet dipped, the water stood still. In Luke 17, when he saw the lepers, he told them to go show the priest, and as they ran, they were healed. The fishes and the loaves, the fishes did not multiply as they were in the basket. That would get very awkward for the little boy's lunchbox if there were suddenly 3,000 fish in his lunchbox. 
They multiplied as they were passed out. Because you see, sometimes the miracle has to be as we're, at, as we're acting, because love is an act. So in this story, we find love in the ladle. We find the act of love. Okay, God, I know you're going to do this, because with the act comes a little bit a little bit of faith we got to sprinkle in there because they scooped it out and we don't know, maybe it still looked like water and they're like, what are we doing? We're going to take this to the guy. He's going to think we're crazy, but we're going. They have to have faith. So we take the te- steps forward to have faith in our acts. We have to choose our spouse every single day in our actions, in our words, in our behaviors. We have to act and know that we will be blessed because of it, because blessing follows obedience. We have to show unconditional love for an perf- imperfect person, just like Jesus did for us. I know sometimes I'm really hard to love because I'm an imperfect person. And I know that Jesus loves me anyways, but I also know that my husband does. So what do you think gives me the confidence? The understanding of who I can be, because you see, when we love somebody and we show them that they are loved unconditionally, it gives them the room to make a mess and still have somewhere safe to land. Just like with our Father in heaven. Gives us the room to make a mess. But as soon as we say his name, he is our safe place to land. I want to go back to verse 10. But you have saved the best until now. But you have saved the best until now. So many people on their wedding days, they they put everything in. They give everything they have to that day and looking just so, and even family members that won't speak, they'll show up on that wedding day because they're going to make sure everybody knows they were there. When the baby is born, they post pictures of the nursery and we show what an amazing baby we're about to have. We go on our first date and our hair is done and we are just so. We have friends over for coffee and our house is pristine. What does it look like after that moment? Because when we walk with God, he says, we get the best now. But you have saved the best until now. When we walk with him, he says, it doesn't matter what your before looked like. He flips the script and he says, this is just your starting point. Do you know how much better we can do beyond this? When we walk with Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have the opportunity to always know the best is next. It's never in our before picture. It's never in our how it started. And here's the thing. Maybe your how it started picture looks awesome. Maybe your how it started is you in a glamour shot along with your husband just killing it. I just dated myself. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. (laughs) But it doesn't matter where you started because God says, no, no, no. I still have the best in store for you. So our first next step every week is I will accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Because you see, when we want to know that the best is always in store, we have to accept Jesus into our lives and we have to follow him. Not just we have to say, yes, I know he's the man and he's in charge. No, no, we have to agree that we want him to be in charge of us of our relationships, of our lives, of our hearts, and of our minds. And it's one of those super simple things, and and we'll say the prayer in just a minute. But the change isn't just in sitting here in this moment and saying a prayer. From there, yes, you get to live with your Father in heaven. But then what does it look like today after the party? How many of you remember when you were saved, that day you were saved? and the excitement, and the enjoyment. And what if that was the first step in your walk of faith? How many of you remember eight weeks ago when we started meeting here again, the excitement and the fervor? 
What if you walked in here every week with that excitement? What if it was the first step? Today is somebody's first step, so if you've already accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to pray with me for your walk and for the people that are starting their walk today. If you've never said yes to Jesus, I want you to pray silently while I pray aloud. Father God, I want you to lead me. Not just today, not just in this moment, but God, I want you in my relationships. I want there to be healing. I want there to be faith. I want there to be a love like I've never known. And God, I know that I can achieve that if you are the one guiding me. I know that you love me unconditionally and that I am imperfect. And for that, you sacrificed your son. He came here and died on the cross, and I know it in my head, and I believe it in my heart. And because I know that you are my safe place to land, I want to follow you every day of my life. I can't wait to get, you know, get to know you better, God. In your holy name we pray, amen. If you've never prayed that prayer before, I want you to mark it on your Connect card so you can let us know. Because we want to celebrate with you and we want to make sure that this isn't just your next step, but instead it's your first step. We won't even beat down your door, I promise. Our next next step is I will take inventory of my responsibility. What are the places in your life, what are the places in your relationships that you can affect change in yourself to allow the opportunity for a miracle in your relationships? Next next step is I will listen when God says slow or grow. That's a hard one for me because I like to know right now what's happening. But oftentimes we hear slow or grow, and those are the moments that we get to hear, and that's the times that we are leaning in to get something even better. The last next step is I will memorize John 2, 10. He said to him, everyone brings out the best wine first. They bring out the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink, but you, you have saved the best until now. What if we brought out the best wine first? What if today, even though your husband and you got in a fight in the car on the way here, you still serve the best wine all afternoon? What if your kids drove you up a wall yesterday and when you get home, you still serve the best wine? What if that friend that's been getting on your last nerve, what if you shoot them a text and they still get the best wine? Think of the change that could occur in you if you're open to the miracles that God's worked. On you guys' way out, make sure you drop your Connect card or your offering envelope. I know TJ talked about it early in service. We have stations all around, but we also have opportunities to click to give. So if you check the next step, if today was your first time here, if you accepted Jesus for the first time and it's your first step, make sure you drop off those cards so that we can celebrate with you on this journey that you get to start. Let's pray, guys. Father, we thank you. We thank you for being a father that, that cares about our marriages, that cares about our relationships with people, that cares about our relationships with our friends and our kids, and that allows us the opportunity to mess up, and that you're here to help us through. Father, we pray that going forward into the next week that the wine that we pour out is one that would fill you with honor. That the love that we show to others is a reflection of the love that you show us as the imperfect people that we are. That our grace, that our kindness, that it's one that, that is unmatched because we are striving to be more like you. We love you, Father, and we pray for every relationship in this room and the ones that are far, far beyond here that you are already waiting in. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Can't wait to see you guys here next 30 at 9, 30, and 11 next Sunday.